It is certainly a blessing to be with you again, to be able to study the Word of God together. And again, I want to express my appreciation to the church here and to the shepherds here for the invitation to be with you. If you want to go ahead and be turning your Bibles to Ruth, uh, that's where we'll be studying for the most part. So if you could, turn to the book of Ruth. And uh, you'll notice in chapter 1, the beginning of Ruth setting some framework for us here, that it came about in the days when the judges governed. It's easy to read Ruth and completely isolate it from the book of Judges. They seem so different, and yet this glorious story of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and all that is involved here, we are told happens in the days when the judges govern. Some have said that the story of Ruth is a diamond in the darkness of a time of departure from God. If the book of Judges was a movie, I'm pretty sure it would not be rated PG even today. When you look at that book, and even the statements there in Judges, the second chapter, in which it says that another generation arose which did not know the Lord. And often the point has been made that we are always only one generation away from apostasy, and that's certainly seen there in Judges, the second chapter. That each generation must be taught and must have their own convictions and understanding of who God is and commitment to the service of Him. But as you move along in Judges, you see just the dire condition of the sin that God's people really became involved in. And the cycles that occurred when there would be a departure and things looked a little bit better, but then there was departure. And, and this continues to go on to the very end of the book in which we read, and we, this should resonate with all of us in the society and culture we live in, that Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And we know what a problem that is, don't we? Jeremiah says, I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself to direct his own footsteps. And Proverbs 14, 12, likewise, tells us there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And God through Isaiah says, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so the only way to ensure that we are on the right path is to listen to what God has taught and revealed in his word. And when men decide they will have their own way, then it goes the wrong direction. We can read Romans chapter 1, and you see that downward spiral of departure from God into all forms of perversion and sin. And yet, with all of that said, as we think about Judges, there is this story. So on one hand, you have a time of spiritual anarchy and rebellion. And yet, here we are, we're going to read a story of great loyalty and faithfulness. And what we're going to see is what God's promise is. And that is, He'll be with His people. And those who are faithful to him, he will not forsake them. Hebrews 13, 5, the scripture reveals that promise. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So as we serve God, even in those moments of distress, we've been talking about some this morning. God will be with his people. Now that does not deny that we have responsibilities, there are conditions of faith, and that sort of thing. But God has made his promise. When we think about this story, I want you to consider the story within the story. You may be familiar with this story, or we, we feel like we're fairly familiar with this account. But there is a story within the story which is the main theme and reason for this book. If I were to say, listen, can you tell me who the primary character in this story is? You may say, Bruce, they must raise them kind of slow in Arkansas because at the top of my page it says this is the book of Ruth. You know, I don't think Ruth, she's an important character. You can't have this story without her. But she's not the primary character. 
You think it's Naomi? No. But what about Boaz? He's important. I would even argue there seems to be foreshadowing going on of our Redeemer. They're all essential to the story, but the primary character of this story is God himself. Somebody else might say, but you know, I like this story so much. It's such a, a, a romantic story, and I hate to burst your bubble here. It is a story about love. But really the story is about God's love and God's faithfulness for his people. And if we don't get that, we miss the reason this is in Scripture, I believe. And we're going to see God working through all of those persons. We're going to see him working through Ruth and through Naomi and through Boaz. And what we're going to see, even in a very difficult circumstance, is God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. And so I hope this will be beneficial to you and profitable to you as we think about this. So let's get right into this. We're going to read a good deal from the text of Scripture, but I can't say it as good as the Holy Spirit, so... Uh, I think that will be a good thing for us to do. So when we start this story in Ruth chapter 1, I mean, it starts in a very intense way. The climax of this story hits us right at the beginning in some ways, as far as the conflict goes. So when you look at Ruth chapter 1, and let's just pick up here in verse 2. The scripture says, well, verse 1 says, There was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Milan and Kilion also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the land where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Let's stop there for a minute and think about what's going on. Now, this would be tragic for anybody and for any woman in any time, in any given culture. But when you really appreciate the culture we're talking about here and the time we're talking about here, what a desperate condition Naomi felt that she was in. I mean, think about it from her standpoint. If, if you, in this time, don't have a male in the family to help provide and protect, you talk about vulnerable. She was extremely vulnerable. And then you have the, the, the sorrow and the feeling of aloneness when she loses her husband. But not only does she lose her husband, she loses her son. So now you have these women, and they're very, very, as I mentioned, vulnerable and exposed to the situation, and certainly had a feeling, at least Naomi did, of, of helplessness and isolation, and the only thing she could think, now that she heard about what was going on in her homeland, was to go home, because there would be some protection there. There was the community of Israel. And so the text indicates that she, she had these, this terrible tragedy that strikes her with her, her husband and her two sons. And then she, says she has these two daughters-in-law. Let's pick up reading now in verse 8. So what about these daughters-in-law? Verse 8, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go. Return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them. And they lifted up their voices and wept. We might pause here for just a minute to say that, look, this says something about Naomi. They loved their mother-in-law. 
I loved her. I don't know that every mother-in-law's love like this one was loved. But they loved her. And we're going to find out later on, they knew of her faith. They knew of her God. She did not keep that to herself. She was a woman of compassion and love and integrity. And here her daughters-in-law are, and they're very concerned about her, and they kissed her, and they, they lifted up, if you can see that and imagine that, their voices, and they wept, and they said, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. Now, that's interesting. At this time, both her daughters-in-law really want to go with her. But Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husband? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If, if I said I have hope, if I even should have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. For it is harder for me than for you. Now listen. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. We were talking about being disoriented in your faith. She's a little disoriented here. She, can't you see why she would feel that way though? She thought God must have turned against me. His, his hand of somehow, his hand of correction or punishment of some kind is, is on me. The, Lord, the hand of the Lord is, has turned against me. But then we come to verse 14. And in verse 14 they lift up their voices and they weep again. And, and, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But notice Ruth, because Ruth is going to be a channel of God's faithfulness and, and His mercy, but Naomi doesn't know that yet. And so the Scripture says, while they both were weeping over her, Ruth clung to her. She wouldn't let go. What a wonderful expression of God's faithful love. So here, Naomi is thinking, God's turned against me, but doesn't really realize how the Lord is using Ruth in her life in so many ways we're going to get into in a moment. Verse 15, then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So Naomi thinks, well, this is a lost cause. <laughs> Might as well end this conversation. She's clinging to me. She's going to go with me. Something to notice in this context is what Ruth knew about Naomi. As I already mentioned, she knew Ruth would go back to her national family, in a sense. Her community. She also knew that she was going to be faithful to her God. She said, your God shall be my God. I don't know what all the conversations might have been about the true and the living God, but she knows that, and she knows if she's going to be a part of that community, that's exactly what's going to happen. So there is a sense in which, even though Naomi feels abandoned by God, through Ruth, his faithfulness is being shown. So as God's chosen nation, Israel, was to be a servant to the other nations, in a sense. A light uh, to the other nations. Naomi seems to be representative of Israel. What's interesting is Ruth is an outsider. That's part of the beauty of this story. You know, sometimes people have the wrong notion about God and those who were Gentiles. In the Old Testament, you know, there's the story of Jonah and the Ninevites. Now, in large part, Gentiles departed from God. But it wasn't because he had no redemptive love for them at all. But that was a decision they made. And eventually are called to come back into Christ. 
But this is interesting. Some call this divine reversal. And what I want you to see is, in the story, if Naomi is part of the community, and here Ruth has been a Moabitess, an outsider, but the outsider, by God's providence, is going to become an insider into God's family. And she's the one showing God's faithfulness. You'll notice with me, if you'll read on with me as she says, where you die, I will die. Come on to verse 20. She said to them, this is Naomi, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full. This is, this is important to see because we're going to circle back around at the end of the lesson. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? Now Naomi returns, but that's how she's feeling. She's being absolutely honest. She's crying out to God. Now there's more to what's going on. And what she may feel or think in the moment is not the entirety of what's actually happening. Just like often when we feel maybe the way Naomi has felt. Maybe disaster has has struck our family or maybe there's tragedy uh, that has been a part of our life or grief or loss or whatever it is. Sometimes we feel like Naomi. But there's much more to the story, but it's important to see what's going on. I will say Naomi had set quite the example for Ruth, though, for this to happen. But then chapter 2. Now things start shifting pretty quick. So we have chapter 1 and things seem so dark and dire. But we come to chapter 2 and what we begin to see is that life will be sustained. That God is going to provide. So the idea, well, the Lord has turned His hand against me. Well, yes, He's allowed these tragedies to occur. But there's, there's more to the story. So come to chapter 2 with me. Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now there's going to be some discussion here about Leveret Law. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 25. The Sadducees kind of use that to ask Jesus a question about the resurrection. That if a man were to pass, that his brother would care for his wife and and take her, and every time I... We go over at Leverett Law at home. I, I usually have sisters that come up to me and say, boy, I'm sure that glad that law is not enforced for us today. I don't know about my brother-in-laws. But that was a provision to care for them. And so in chapter 2, now all at once we have Boaz come in on the scene. Now here's another manifestation of God's grace. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Let me stop here for just a minute. Leviticus 19, 9 and 10 helps us understand what's going on as far as what Boaz is going to do for them. One of the arguments that we hear from atheists a lot, uninformed atheists, but very popular atheists, uh, the atheists that have published some books and our young people tend to read sometimes. Richard Dawkins, who just hates God. Hitchens, who has passed on but wrote a lot of things. Others. Dawkins will say, well, you know, the, the God of the Bible and the God I read about in the Old Testament, he... He's some kind of xenophobic, racist, bigoted God. And they were afraid of strangers and foreigners and and all just the worst things you can imagine. The amazing thing to me about that is when someone makes those arguments, it is evident to me that they haven't read enough from the Bible. Or that what they have read has been read with such a a biased approach, they're denying what the text actually says. So here's my bit of advice. And I tell my atheist friends this as well. If you're going to criticize the book, read it first. Read it first. I mean, if you're going to criticize the text of Scripture, we're going to have this dialogue and conversation. I'm okay with having the dialogue and conversation. 
but at least be informed. I mean, you expect for me to be informed. And I think you have a right for me to be informed so we can have an intelligent dialogue, but at least read the book first. There were all kinds of provisions in the Old Testament that didn't exist in in other nations for those who were outside, for those who were widows, for orphaned persons, In this case, you have an outsider. There's provision for them. How strangers and foreigners should be treated. And so again, it was not any kind of racist type of thing. There was even provision. Now, was there preservation for the Messianic lineage? Yeah, sure. To benefit all peoples? Yes. And about this time, this is when the Canaanites get brought up. God had been patient with the Canaanites for over 400 years. And one of the things that our atheist friends don't ever bring up is that they were involved in ritual prostitution, they were involved in infanticide, they were involved in all kinds of things. That doesn't get brought up. Let me tell you why it doesn't get brought up, friends. Because that doesn't fit the anti-God narrative. But that's what we find in text of Scripture. So the God of the Old Testament was a loving God. Now, do we see his wrath poured out against wickedness and sin? Yes. But again, if you're going to critique the story, I think Christians have every right to ask that you get the story right at least so we can have an intelligent conversation about this. So even here, when you look in the story of Ruth, there were these provisions made for those who might be suffering. Verse 3, so she departed. And went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz. I see the providence of God here. Who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? The servant in charge of the reapers replied, She is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house for a little while. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maid. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Now notice her attitude. And this tells you about the character of of Ruth. Then she fell on her face and bowing to the ground said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? She recognized her condition. Boaz replied to her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. Notice this beautiful language, verse 12. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. Now, do you remember what Naomi had said? I came full, but I left empty. Boaz says, my prayer is that your wages will be full from the Lord. Can we sometimes feel empty when really we're going to be made full by God? Boaz says, listen, Ruth, I see beyond your ethnicity, I see your character. I see your integrity. I see the kind of person you are, the quality and virtue of your character. That's what I'm I'm seeing, and I'm praying that God will bless you. Verse 13, then she said, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord. For you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here that you may eat the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he served her roasted grain and she ate and was satisfied and had some left. 
And when she rose to glean, Boaz commanded his servants, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not insult her. Also you shall purposely pull out for her some grain from the bundles, and leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she also took it out and gave Naomi what she had left after she was satisfied. Her mother-in-law then said to her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? May he who took notice of you be blessed. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, May he be blessed of the Lord who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, The man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, Furthermore, he said to me, You should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. She tells her, "It's, It's good that you do what he said. Just think about this account. We start out with such disaster. And here comes... Boaz, who does seem to be a foreshadow of our kinsman redeemer, but because of Leverett Law, it all all just seems to be working out. It's the hand of providence in God that they're going to enjoy. So we go from what seems very dark to the light of God's providence. We see the language looking there at verse 12 of even the prophets regarding God's care for his people. Look at it again. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord God of Israel. Listen to this. Under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. How did they come under God's wings? Because they came into God's family. There is a a sentiment out here, I'm going to serve God isolated from God's people. Listen to me, you can't do that. Now, there's a sense in which my belief and my convictions are not determined by anybody other than me reading God's Word and knowing what is true. But this notion that we're going to go out here and live on an island somewhere and not interact with the people of God is nowhere found in Scripture. And so here, Boaz is showing concern for her you know one of the interesting things about leviticus 19 which that provision seems to be referenced in what's going on in that text he says you shall leave them for the needy and the stranger listen i am the lord your god now think about that the provision that was being made by god's law for god's people for the stranger he says i am the lord your god that is basically to say i am the covenant making god I am the God of promise. If you respect me, you will carry this mercy out. And here was this noble man. You know something else in chapter 2 and verses 5 through 9 about Boaz? Is that love and faithfulness does not do the bare minimum. We get, kind of get caught up in, okay, what? What's the bare minimum I can do and God still be pleased with me? Well, let me tell you, if that's what you're thinking, He's not pleased with you. Now, we all need His grace and mercy. But, brethren, listen, this is not a bare minimum do the least that you can. That's not how love works. That's not how love for God works. That's not how love for your children works. Husbands, that's not how love for your wife works. Because love does not seek her own. Love is sacrificial. So what we should be asking is, how do I more abundantly show my love for God? Aren't you thankful? I'm thankful that God didn't look at us that way. That he went above and beyond the offering of his only begotten son. Boaz shows us that faithfulness does not do the bare minimum. It does all it can. And we see Ruth's humility. It's, it's, it's striking. And even Naomi is beginning to see 
God's provision. Now, it's coming through Boaz, but God works through his people. Now, that leads us to chapter 3, and the story continues to be elevated. Now we see the Redeemer is really revealed here. Notice in chapter 3, then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now, is not Boaz our kinsman with whose maid you were? Behold, he went as Bartley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go and uncover his feet and lie down, and then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had commanded her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came secretly and uncovered his feet and lay down. It happened in the middle of the night that the man was startled and bent forward. And behold, a woman was lying at his feet. He said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid. For you are a close relative. Then he said, May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask. For all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Now, I want you to think about what's going on here. It, the, Naomi says, Listen, there, there, there is an opportunity here. It's almost as if so she's purifying herself anointing herself. Ruth does as Naomi requests. He seems to providentially be in the position to care for her. But let me say this, and I know I've talked about modernist scholars a lot today, but there are other modernist scholars, and I've seen this, and of course there's no place for deep theology like Facebook. <laughs> really where you can have all kinds of lack of understanding and and crazy absurd foolish things said and people say hey I ought to bring that question to Bible class that'll be a good one to bring up but there have been those who try to go to this text and argue that there was some kind of sexual immorality here. All that I know to say to somebody that would write or say or publish anything like that is shame on you. There is nothing ungodly. Can, am I really supposed to think that in this story of Ruth, You have all of Boaz's integrity and character and all of that. You have Ruth. I mean, that would unravel the whole story and what's going on. You have have Ruth that has shown nothing but character and integrity. And you take one of the most beautiful scenes in this entire story and you turn it into something filthy and ungodly. Shame on you. That is not what's going on. In fact, some of this language here in chapter 3 is also found of God's care for His people. Chapter 3 and verse 9, spread your covering over your maid. That language is used in Ezekiel 16 for God's covering for His people. There is nothing immoral or ungodly. Get your mind out of the gutter. And see the faithfulness of God And what's going on here in chapter 3? Now, she was asking for marriage. She was asking for protection. Boaz felt loved and honored by Ruth. But we learned something else about Boaz. He's not a compromiser. Because there's no doubt he has these strong feelings for her. She has these strong feelings for him. And there's a lot at stake here. But he says, but there is one relative that's closer. We've got to follow the law here. And so without going into all the business about the sandal and all all of that, you have basically 
a, a ceremony of kind, and he goes and talks to the one that is the closer relative, and once he gets the full picture, he decides, no, that's okay. And so by God's providence and God's faithfulness, as we come on to chapter 4, Boaz presents the case, and Boaz will be her husband, and he will care for her. Look at chapter 4 in verses 13 and 14. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may His name become famous in Israel. Now watch this, verse 15. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. I had a lady in Bible class when we read that one time. She said, Brother Bruce, does that mean women are better than men? (laughs) What, What beautiful thoughts here. Look at verse 16. Then Naomi. Now remember Naomi when she said, I was full, but I'm coming back empty. Verse 16, then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his name. The neighbor women gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Now watch watch, watch the verse here. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse. The father of David. You know whose lineage that is, don't you? She, in a sense, is in the messianic lineage. This Moabite is coming. Naomi ends up being as full as she could ever possibly have imagined. And you thought the lesson was over. I saw the smile on your face, but hang on. Okay? Let's just make these points of application. What do we need to learn? We need to learn that the Lord is faithful to his promise. When the day seems so dark, he's faithful. He is so very faithful to his promise. If I miss this, I miss it. I can know about Ruth and Naomi and Boaz. I need to know about God. I need to see his faithfulness, but there's something else. There is a sense of redemptive restoration through God's people. This is really important for us. There is a sense of restoration through God's people. I want to share something that a a brother has written. It's entitled, The People in the Pew. They are parents burdened because of their prodigal children. They are grandparents raising grandchildren because if they don't, who will? They are caregivers wondering if anyone understands. They are single parents facing double duty because they have no choice. They are brethren struggling with sins. They are smiling faces hoping to hide their depression. They are a childless couple facing disappointment again. They are folks facing both cancer and fears. They are parents who have had to do the unthinkable and bury a child. They are parents struggling to raise a special needs child. They are brothers and sisters who have done everything they know to keep their marriage together, and they continue to try. They are widows who sit down as one at a table of two. They are sisters who harbor the difficulty of an unbelieving husband. They are step-parents who seem to be on the outside looking in. They are lonely. They are the scared. They are the hurting. But they come, and they worship the king. They come to the table to share their grief with the one who gave his all. They come to lift up their voice in song while brushing away a tear. They come to pray and connect with their only hope and with their brethren. They come to encourage someone else while hoping someone will encourage them. They come to hear the good news. These are the people in the pew. He ends by saying, funny, they look a lot like you and me. 
There's restoration in the community. And then we're going to end here. This is the final point. Look how God turns everything back around. What does that mean? It means that God can transform emptiness into fullness, mourning into joy, death into life, despair into hope, brokenness into restoration, alienation into fellowship, pain into healing. Think about Ruth. Think about Naomi. Lostness into redemption, anxiety into peace. And so as you think about your life this morning, as you think about Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, as they sought God faithfully, remember this. Read this story of Ruth again. Read the scripture. The Lord never fails. You've listened so very well. Thank you for your good attention. If you're not a child of God, we want to invite you to come. Come to the family of God. Come to the Lord. Because outside of Jesus, you really are empty. But in Christ, you can have all the fullness of His blessings. Will you obey the gospel? Come now as together we stand.